Welcome to another exciting UDK tutorial, folks. Matthew Doyle for Scaleform here once again. This is the third tutorial on mastering a GFX HUD in UDK. We'll be going over the main HUD class, GFX Minimap HUD.UC, in the September 2010 UDK build. If you've watched the previous tutorials, you'll know that this is the actual class that does all the HUD magic. As before, we've got a whole lot of ground to cover, so rather than explain every graphical HUD element, I'm just going to go over a few of the key elements. You'll be able to use that knowledge to understand everything else. So let's get rolling. Open up udkhud.fla if you haven't already. Likewise, open GFX Minimap HUD.UC in your favorite editor. Now, if you recall, GFX Minimap HUD is the class that actually extends GFX Movie Player. Put succinctly, this class caches references to all the HUD movie clips and text fields in the flash file. It then updates those elements as needed. There's a considerable number of global variables in this class. First, we have a few related to the minimap. Next, we have the message row data structure and several variables related to log messages. Then we get to a whole mess of GFX objects. These are references to flash elements within the UDK HUD Swift file. Following these, we have some variables that will be used to store the last known amounts for things like health, armor, ammo count, etc. These are important to knowing whether a HUD element should be updated or not. We'll skip over the first function, register minimap view, for now. I'll be explaining the minimap in a future video. For now, just understand that this function is called from flash when the minimap is loaded. The next two functions are used to initialize everything needed for the log display in the HUD. First up is create message row. This function returns a GFX object, in this case an empty movie clip. When called, it will create a new empty movie clip nested inside the GFX object log MC using attach movie, which can be used in the log displayed on screen. The first parameter specifies which library symbol should be attached from the flash file. In this case, this is the export name of the log message symbol. The second parameter specifies the name for the new symbol, log message 1, log message 2, etc. Next is init message row. This function uses the message row data structure declared above to initialize a new message row. It gets called from the next function, init, as we'll see a bit later. On line 105, we call the previous function create message row and store a reference to the attached log message movie clip in mrow.mc. Using git object, we can then cache a reference to the text field within that message row movie clip so that we can set its text. Let's check out the flash object structure. In the library panel, open the log assets folder and double click the log message movie clip to open it. Clicking on the object on stage, we can see that it has an instance name of message. Drilling down into that movie clip, we find the actual text field, which has an instance name of text field. If you go back now into the HUD class file, line 107 starts to make more sense now. Now we want the text field to allow for HTML style text tags. So we use set bool to set the HTML property of mrow.tf to true. Set string is used to set the HTML text field to be empty of any actual text for now. Finally, we add the new message row to our pool of available message rows, the free messages array, before returning the newly created and configured GFX object mrow.mc. This brings us to the init function. If you recall, this function is called by utgfxhudwrapper.uc when it first instantiates the HUD. Its core job is to cache references to all of the flash movie clips and text fields. The first local variable is used in a for loop a bit further down. The next variable has been deprecated, so you can ignore it. Next, we call the superclass, or GFX Movie Player, init function. This is general object-oriented programming practice. There's likely to be logic in GFX Movie Player's init function that needs to be executed. Since we override the function, we have to either call the superclass's version or copy and paste that code here. We store the world info so that we can easily access it later, and we need to retrieve the game replication info. We also get all the game data and store it in GRI. Next comes the two GFX functions that start the movie and begin playback, 
start, and advance, respectively. This next little block sets the initial values for several important variables, including the number of log messages, as well as the last health, armor, ammo, etc. We set these to negative amounts since we're starting a new game. Next up is a block of if statements, which makes use of that deprecated temporary GFX object above. You can ignore all these if statements completely as such. For the sake of explanation, though, I'll tell you what these do. Essentially, they were used to hide movie clips that we don't want visible when the game starts. We store a movie clip from the flash file inside the temporary widget using get variable object. We then test to see if our get variable object returned a valid reference. If it does, we use set bool to set the visibility of that object to false. If it didn't, then the movie clip did not exist and there's no need to hide it. None of these movie clips exist in the current HUD flash file though. Moving on, we cache a reference to the log movie clip from the root of the timeline in Flash. In Flash, we see on the log layer that we have an empty movie clip with an instance name of log. We then run a for loop that executes the init message row function above, giving us a total of 15 new movie clips, containing empty HTML text fields for the message log. We then cache references to all the various movie clips and text fields in the Flash file. We want to cache references to these items once, to avoid retrieving them every time we need to access or modify one, which incurs a small performance penalty. As an example, let's look at the health text field in movie clip. We cache underscore root dot player stats dot health in in health tf using get variable object. Health bar mc contains underscore root dot player stats dot health. Let's head into the flash file now. We start out in the root of the hierarchy, underscore root. If you click on the bottom right movie clip, you'll see it has an instance name of player stats. This gives us underscore root dot player stats. Now drill down into player stats by double clicking it. Inside this movie clip, unlock the health in layer and click on the text field on the stage. You'll see it has an instance name of health in, giving us a hierarchy of underscore root dot player stats dot health in just as we've cached it from Unreal Script. Now unlock the health layer and click on the health bar graphic. It has an instance name of health, giving us a hierarchy of underscore root dot player stats dot health. Alright, back in Unreal Script. Here we have a block that caches the team-based movie clips. Note that if the game is not a team game, we set several of these movie clips to be hidden with the set visible property of that object. The various directional hit indicator movie clips are stored as elements of the hit loc mc array, starting from the top indicator and moving around clockwise. After we've cached all these references, we then do some 3D transforms on several of them. Action Script 2 does not distinguish between floating point and integer numbers, so we use set float to send the y rotation value to each of the movie clips, rotating them slightly on the y axis in 3D space. Last of all, the init function calls clear stats with a parameter of true. Let's skip over the next function, which simply formats time into hours, minutes, seconds format to explain clear stats. Clear stats job is simply to set the various HUD movie clips and text fields to a new game state. The first three lines create an AS display info instance that will be used to set the X size or width of graphical status bars. We tell DI that it has X scale then set the X scale value to 0% of its maximum size. Let's take a closer look at a few of these if statements. This second if statement checks to see if last health is currently something other than the initialized value of negative 10. If it is, we set the health text field to empty using set string on the text property of the cached reference to the text field. We also set the health bar movie clip, which as you've seen is a solid green bar, to have the display info properties we stored in DI above. This effectively sets the health bar graphic to 0% in width, rendering it hidden. Finally, we set last health to negative 10 to represent a new game state. We do something similar for last ammo count, but in this case there's no graphical bar. Let's have a quick look at the ammo indicator in Flash. We can see that the ammo indicator uses a keyframed animation, with each keyframe showing a different amount of ammo. So back in GFX Minimap HUD, we tell the ammo bar movie clip to go to and stop I on frame 51, which essentially tells it to display an empty frame with no graphic. The I in go to and stop stands for integer, as we're passing a frame number as an integer. You could also use go to and stop without the I. 
In that case, you would have to pass a string value corresponding to a frame label in Flash. And looking at Last Weapon, we see that we also hide the movie clip using set visible false. Okay, moving right along to our next function. Put succinctly, add message is used to display log messages. This function gets called from add death message below, as well as from localized message in UT GFX HUD wrapper. It expects two parameters, the type of message and the message itself, both the strings. We want every new log message to push older messages up the screen by a specific amount, and we'll use an AS Display Info instance to change the XY coordinates of log messages already being displayed to make space for the new message. If the message has no length to it, then there's nothing to display, so we can safely return. Now, if there are any currently unused log messages available in our free messages pool, we can use those rather than create a new message. To do so, we simply pop one off at the end of the free messages list and continue with it. But if there are no currently available message rows, we'll use the oldest log message row that is currently being displayed. Then we set the string to be displayed in the mRow text field using set string as well as what type of message it is. The new log message will have a Y value of zero. This Y coordinate will be relative to the movie clip that it's attached to. In this case, this will cause new messages to be displayed at the bottom of the log movie clip container. We tell the log messages movie clip to go to and play show, effectively displaying it. Looking back in the flash file, we can see that the log message is fully displayed starting at the show frame for a few seconds before finally fading out. After that, we use a for loop to set the Y value of each log message so that all the older log messages move up by the amount specified in message height. Notice that we can reuse the same AS Display Info instance for each set display info call by simply modifying its Y property rather than creating a new AS display info for each call. You'll find the value of message height in the default properties, and it happens to be set to 38 pixels. Last of all, we insert the new log message row into the pool of log messages that are currently being displayed. All right, so that's gonna do it for this video. We'll have to pick up on the next video with update game HUD. And we'll continue with there, and we should finish up with GFX Minimap HUD in that video. Until then, this is Matthew Doyle for Scaleform. As always, signing off.